Hey guys, welcome to my channel. Today I am really excited to run through all the books that I read in the month of August. I ended up with uh, my total being 14 books in the month of August, and that does include one DNF, but I read more than 50% of it, so we're going to review it in here anyway. We're going to start out with one of my five star reads from the month, and that is A Sorceress Comes to Call by T. Kingfisher. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a T. Kingfisher girly, right? Like, I love everything that she writes, and there was no question when this book came out that I was going to pick it up right away, and I was not disappointed. Let me tell you a little bit about what it's about. This book is a loose, I would say loose retelling of the fairy tale, The Goose Girl, which I did not previously know before I uh, read this book. And I did read the fairy tale after I read the book, and I have to tell you that it's a very loose retelling. Um, there are some characters with the same names. There are geese um, and some similar kind of themes, but it's not really a retelling. It's more kind of inspired by. So I'm going to read you just a little bit of the blurb so that you can get an idea. And it says, Cordelia knows her mother is unusual. Their house doesn't have any doors between rooms. There are no secrets in this house. And her mother doesn't allow Cordelia to have a single friend. Unless you count Falada, her mother's beautiful white horse. The only time Cordelia feels truly free is on her daily rides with him. So that's your setup for this. We have Cordelia, who is honestly quite abused and mistreated by her mother, who is the sorceress in the title of this book. And she's been trapped in, in the house with her mother. Her mother has mistreated her quite badly. To be honest, um, she's able to possess Cordelia's mind and make Cordelia, or anyone really, say and do whatever it is that she wants them to do. That seems like that's kind of her main power as a sorceress. And one day, she comes home and tells Cordelia that she's going to be married to a rich man, only he doesn't know it yet. And they manage to find their way to living on his charity, to living in his house. And this man has a sister who is named Hester, and Hester is the other main character in this book. Hester is one of those uh, kind of feisty old ladies that T. Kingfisher writes so very well, and I just loved her. And so the story goes on. I don't want to spoil it because there's a lot of twists and turns here. I will just say that if you are a fan of humorous fantasy, I think you would like this. I also think that this book really treads the line between horror and fantasy. So if you're looking for something kind of in between the two, maybe you're looking to read something in the month of October, but you don't want a super aggressive horror book, I think this would be a good choice. It does have some kind of gore and things like that in it. It's not completely just like sweet fantasy. I wouldn't call it cozy fantasy or any of those things, but I thought it was fantastic. I just loved it. It's taken its place near the top of my list of T. King Fisher books right after Nettle and Bone, which remains my favorite. And I would highly recommend that you check it out. After I read A Sorceress Comes to Call, the second book I read in the month was the new release from James S.A. Corey, The Mercy of Gods. So kind of a typical James S.A. Corey cover there. Um, I'm going to be honest and just let you know that I was pretty disappointed by this book as the start of a new series. It just did not work for me. And I am someone who is a fan of The Expanse. I haven't finished it yet, but I have liked all of the volumes that I read. And this just did not work for me. In comparison to The Expanse, I would say it is something that is trying to be a little bit less of a pop kind of space opera and more of a hard sci-fi. Um, so we start on a planet named Anjan. And on Anjan, which is very much like Earth, but is not Earth, uh, we start out at, the, at a university where we have these students who are working on a project um, that is something science-y that I didn't really ever understand through the course of the entire book. So that's okay, but it's not really important, so don't worry about it. And there is an alien invasion. They, there is an alien invasion by this species called the Carrix, who are clearly going to be the bad guys in this new series. The Carrix are kind of, um, I would say they're kind of like insect-like aliens would be the way that I would describe them. They're pretty not human. Um, they are not human-like at all. They are not going to be something that you can relate to on a human level. And they're kind of scavenger aliens who travel from planet to planet and just scavenge that planet and take it over for their own usage. So that's the setup for the book. Um, in terms of the plot, it's very slow. It just moves very, very slowly. A lot of world building, a lot of um, meeting a lot of characters who were not super distinct to me. 
and who, if I'm honest, I really did not care about. It just, it was just really disappointing. It just, it just didn't land for me. Um, I just found it to be kind of boring, which is, which is really not a great thing in a, um, in a sci-fi book, right? So I don't recommend this one. Um, I do recommend The Expanse and you're going to see more of that later in this video, but I don't recommend this. Uh, maybe if the second book comes out and people say it's amazing, I could probably be talked into reading it. I'm not saying I won't read it, but I think that for me, I mean, this maybe wound up around a two and a half star, which is just not enough for me to recommend it. Then I continued a series that I am right in the middle of, and that is the Wayward Children series by Shauna McGuire. And I just read volume five, Come Tumbling Down. This is a continuation of the story of Jack and Jill, who we meet in the first book and whose story we find out in the second book. The second book is actually my favorite book in the series so far, so I was really excited to continue their story, and I am sad to report that it did not really work for me. Um, I think that these books, um, I, I struggle with them a little bit because they are so very, very short as novellas that it often feels like so much of the action takes place off camera and you don't really get to see it. And that was definitely the case here where it felt like a lot of walking and not a lot of action. And as though the bad guy in the story just folds in about five minutes with no real effort on the part of our intrepid heroes. Um, and I didn't even really care about Jack, who was previously my favorite character, and I just didn't feel like we needed to go back to this world. I was happy with the place where we ended with these characters at the end of book two, and I didn't need to go back. And in addition, I have to say that I continue to not understand why these children want to go to these worlds, because they are universally horrible. I mean, it just feels like every world is full of ways to die terribly, and this is no exception. The Moors, by the way, is the name of the, the world in this book. It's the same as the one in book two. So I was not a super big fan of this. It was kind of disappointing. I was looking forward to it because I did like their story so much in book two. Um, I am obviously, I'm, this is book five. I am invested. I am gonna read every single one of these books that she puts out. But for me, this landed about a three star, which means it was just okay. After reading all that fantasy and sci-fi at the beginning of the month, I decided I needed to read something a little bit different, and I picked up a literary fiction. This is Southernmost, and the author is Silas House. So Silas House is a uh, native Kentuckian. Um, I think he lives in my hometown of Louisville. Um, I know he's the current poet laureate of the state of Kentucky, and I have never read one of his books. Love this cover, picked it up in a charity shop, decided that it would be a good one to read because the premise was very intriguing to me. Our main character is Asher. Asher is a Pentecostal preacher in a small Tennessee town in the Appalachian Mountains. And at the beginning of the book, there has been a terrible flood and one of the people that he goes to help save is um, he saves a gay couple and his wife, does not necessarily want anything to do with them. She says they can't stay with them because after their house got destroyed. But what does end up happening is that the couple ends up coming to his church. And this starts a real controversy with his congregation who do not agree with their way of life, think that they're sinners, and do not believe that they should be allowed to attend church. Asher has um, actually got a gay brother who he feels very bad for having treated poorly earlier in his life. So. At the beginning of the book, he's kind of already questioned, I would say, all of his beliefs. Um, he's already missing his brother and wishing that he'd been there for his brother. He also has a young son, Jeremy, who is um, a very sensitive child. And this is something he and his wife fight about because she feels like he needs to toughen up and be a man. And Asher's saying, maybe these aren't the right lessons for us to be teaching him. Maybe we need to let him be who he is. And that's the central conflict of the beginning of the book. And that's the setup that I was really excited about. And I do think that that part really paid off for me. Where I was a little bit disappointed was the fact that um, we didn't get to see Asher grapple with his faith and with these people who were challenging him in things that he had believed so deeply, because that had all happened before the book ever started. And to me, that was a little bit of a missed opportunity because I really wanted to see that. That's something 
you'll see later in this video, um, that that's something, stories like that, stories of people grappling with their faith and changing their faith and um, deepening their faith, all things that are very, very interested to me. And he didn't really do that here. Um, but what does end up happening is that um, he separates from his wife. It ends up being a really contentious custody battle. And a good portion of the book actually takes place in Key West, Florida, as opposed to in Appalachia, where the beginning part of the book happens. And again, that was something that I didn't like quite as much because I really wanted to focus on that small town atmosphere. But having said that, um, I think it's a really good book. I gave it four stars. I particularly loved the relationship between Asher and his son. Jeremy is the rare child character who's not irritating. He's not too young. I just loved him. Um, and I did think the book, the ending was good. I thought it came full circle. Uh, Asher is a very, very um, frustrating character who is going to constantly make decisions that you will not agree with and that you will say, that's gonna end so poorly, stop. And he will do them anyway. So, be aware of that, but I would definitely recommend this, particularly if you're interested in reading um, some Southern writers and reading someone who's very familiar with the region. Um, I just think it's really good and probably underrated because I haven't seen that many people talking about it. After I read Southernmost, I picked up my lone romance novel of the month, which is Check and Mate by Allie Hazelwood. So this is Allie Hazelwood's young adult book, um, which... Is it a young adult book? I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm gonna get into the things that, that challenged me about this book, but let me talk about the plotline first. Our main character is Mallory and she is a chess prodigy who has quit playing because of some drama in her past involving her father. Also, she's basically the caretaker for her mother who is disabled and her two younger sisters. She gets convinced to participate in kind of like a charity chess tournament, and she ends up beating one of the top chess players in the world named Nolan, who is also young and who might be this fellow pictured on the cover right here. I am a big Allie Hazelwood fan. I love her books. I don't love everything that she writes because she writes a lot of different styles of romance. They don't always work for me. Um, this one ended up about a three star. I thought that there were some things that were really cute. I did enjoy the relationship between Mallory and Nolan. Um, but whether you will enjoy this or not, I would say is very much based in how much you enjoy chess. Because I thought, Allie, you can do this. You can make chess interesting to me, even though every time I've ever had to play chess in my whole life, I wanted to fall asleep. And she did not do it. There is so much chess in this book. But if you like chess, have I got a book for you because there is so much chess and I bet you that it is very accurate, but I don't know that for sure because I don't know anything about chess. I question whether this is a young adult book because I think that it deals with some themes that are much more adult than I would feel comfortable giving to someone who was on the younger end of the young adult spectrum. So like, I think young adult starts with like 13 um, and I have a 13 year old um, niece and I would not, I would not give her this book. This book this book is too old for her. Uh, there's not anything graphic. Um, it's fairly closed door, the physical relationship between the two characters. But there is a lot of talk and a lot of stuff going on with Mallory and how she likes to like hook up with guys. And there's just things about it that for me felt more adult than I felt comfortable with in a book that is rated as young adult. If this were not rated as young adult, it'd be fine. Um, and I don't think it needs to be because the characters are out of high school. So I don't even know why this is read, like called young adult. I don't think it's young adult. But anyway, it's not my favorite one of her books. Um, it's probably ranking kind of down at the bottom, to be honest. Um, it was all right. It was still cute. I don't hate that I read it, but didn't wow me the way that a lot of her books do. So take that as you will. After I finished my romance for the month, um, I went ahead and I picked up a new release mystery thriller, and that is The God of the Woods by Liz Moore. I don't have a physical copy of this, but I am looking for a physical copy of this because I rated this book five stars, and I actually think that it was my top book of the month. I just loved it so much. I know everyone's been talking about this. Um, I know 
I just went to a bookstore yesterday and tried to buy it and they don't have any copies because everyone's book club is reading it. Everyone's been reading it. And it's, it's just, it really is as good as all the hype that you're hearing. This is the story of a summer camp for children in the Adirondacks in New York in the 1970s and then flashing back to the 1950s. We follow uh, campers, we follow their counselors, we follow the family that owns the camp, and we follow them all as the daughter of the owner of the camp, Barbara, has gone missing. Not only that, Barbara's not the first child from her family to go missing on the property as her brother, Bear, went missing many years before and was never found. So that's the setup for the book. Um, we are actually following multiple characters and we are following them in many different time periods. If I had the book here, which I don't, um, I would show you that each chapter has a little timeline and it'll show you exactly where you are, like July 1975 and what character you're following at the beginning of the chapter. So I was never confused about what was going on, which was great. For a book that follows that many characters, um, she just did a fantastic job. And I would say primarily um, it is a mystery, but this is a book about women's roles and the ways in which they were in the past and still are limited by society. Um, for everyone from the camp counselor to Barbara herself to Barbara's mother, we see that all of them are limited by what they are allowed to be. And that's kind of one of the major themes of the book. I would consider it to be a very feminist book. And I I'm into that and just loved it. Um, I don't want to say any more because I don't want to spoil it, but I do want to really encourage you that if you have not picked this book up, you definitely need to check it out. It was five stars and I read it in about two days, even though it's almost 500 pages long and I just loved it. The next book that I read was The Lost Story by Meg Schaffer. This book has a gorgeous cover. It's so pretty. Look at it. I mean, how can you not want to read it? But for me, it did not work. Um, it, I gave this two stars and I think that that was really in the moment, I think based on my own frustration with where I thought the book was gonna go and what I thought it was going to be and what it ended up being. This is the story of a girl who is looking for her sister. Her sister has been missing for many years. Um, she didn't even know she had a sister until she found her in a DNA database. And now she's trying to figure out where she went. She finds a man named Jeremy who is famous for finding lost girls and asked if he asks if he will help her. And to her surprise, he says yes. And not only that, but he saw her sister years ago when he himself was missing in a magical kind of alternate world, adult Narnia, whatever you want to call it. Um, so they go on a little bit of a training montage. They pick up his friend Rafe, who he was lost with all these years ago, and they eventually find their way into this magical world. Um, and the world itself was fine, but I would say not particularly different from anything that I've seen before. Um, I just really struggled with the pacing of this book. We don't even get to the other world until 50% of the way through the book, which is just a lot to ask from your readers when that's the whole point of the book. And once we got there, I didn't even care about it that much. Um, it turned into a little bit of a love story uh, between Jeremy and Rafe, which was fine. I didn't mind them together, but it wasn't what I thought I was getting when I started the book, which was looking for this girl's sister. Do we find the sister? Sure. But it's not the point of the book anymore. It's like halfway through, the book just shifts everything about itself. It's almost like you're reading two different books. I just could not. I did not like it. Um, I thought the ending was underwhelming. It was a chore and a slog to get through, even though I think it's not even 300 pages long. And I cannot recommend it. It's, it was just so disappointing. And I do have a, a vlog reading this if you, you want to see me come apart at the seams while I try desperately to like this book that has such a beautiful cover and sounds so great, but just did not work for me. So can't recommend that one. I gave it two stars. Um, did like the first half better than the second half, but in general, I, th I think it's just disappointing, badly paced. Not, not my thing. And then after that, I read another novella, The Dead Cat Tale Assassins by P.J. Lee Clark. So I have read Master of Jin by P.J. Lee Clark, which I really, really loved. 
Um, I thought his world building was excellent. I loved that it was set in such a different world. And I have been interested to check out some of his novellas. And when this one came out and the library offered it to me, I was like, yes, please, I will check this out. But this, I will tell you, is the book that I DNF'd this month. Um, I got to, I think, about 60% of the way through and realized I didn't care about any of the characters or what was going on um, and decided that I just didn't want to finish it. And life is too short. That's my philosophy and I'm sticking with it. So I didn't finish it. I, I thought the world building in the book was actually really excellent. I liked the dead cat tail assassins who in fact are undead assassins. That's what they are. But it was really hard for me to care about the characters. I think in particular because when you become one of the dead cat tail assassins, you can't remember anything about your life prior to dying. Um, so it was it was hard to connect with our main character and then some of the others, I mean, they just, they just weren't, I wasn't that into it. So it's not a bad book. I'm sure there's gonna be an audience for it and I'm sure lots of people are gonna like it, but it was just not working for me at the time that I tried to read it. So I put it down. So that's my DNF for the month. Okay, next I have a book that I feel like I should have saved for spooky season, but did not. Um, and that is, We Used to Live Here. Who's that by? By Marcus Kluwer. All right, so this book, I uh, really love this book. This is a this is a scary, scary book, uh, and I am not easily scared. So if a book was making me a little bit jumpy in my old house at night, um, that says something because I'm I'm not. This book uh, actually started out as a story on the No Sleep subreddit. If you've ever been there, which I have a few times, um, and I think I actually had read it on the subreddit previously, but it's very different. I would say in the book form. It is the story of a couple named Charlie and Eve. That's their name, right? Yeah. Charlie and Eve. And one night, Eve is alone in the house. And someone stops by and says, hey, I used to live here growing up. Could I bring my family in? Just like show them around just because we're in the neighborhood. And Eve is kind of like, yeah, I don't want to do that. That's sketchy. But then she thinks you're being ridiculous. And she lets them in. And that was not a good idea. And it goes from there. Um, it's going to be really hard to explain this book without spoiling anything, which I am not willing to do. I would say that if you are the kind of person who enjoys a book full of found material, um, I love found material. I love videos and pictures and um, transcripts and articles that are stuck on somebody's wall somewhere. Like I am obsessed with that. And there's a lot of that in here. There's also within the book, there's like a lot of, um, I would say kind of like codes. One of the things, there's actually Morse code, like, I don't know if you can see that because I don't think I have enough light. Well, trust me, there's actually Morse code at um, the end of some of the sections that you can figure out that turns into a phrase, which I actually did do. There are other codes in here, which I don't know how to crack, but I'm sure somebody online has done. I know there's like some phone numbers you can actually call and get like, real messages from like things like that like is it good it's probably just good marketing but i am so into it there's a lot of just kind of like what is going on reality shifting stuff in this book it's just really hard for me to explain but if you like a haunted house story or if you like found material or if you like i would say kind of twisty um who knows what's real kind of horror stories then i would definitely recommend it um it is legitimately scary and legitimately confusing and for me it was about a four and a half star maybe five i haven't quite decided yet but this was one of the best scary books i've read in quite some time so i just really loved it and i would highly 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 recommend that you put this on your list for this spooky season because it's going to be perfect okay the next book that i read was Basically, I would say a response to how much I didn't like The Mercy of the Gods. And that is that I decided to continue. This was on my TBR, but I wasn't sure if I was going to read it. But I did continue The Expanse in the month of August, and I read Abaddon's Gate. Abaddon's Gate is the uh, third book. I don't know if this is a popular and unpopular opinion, but this was my favorite book in the series so far. Um, I thought it was five star five star read for me. Um, I thought a lot of the stuff that was not perfect in the first two books, they really fixed for me. 
I don't want to spoil it because we're, we're getting into third book territory. It's like, you know, but we are following a familiar cast of ragtag characters. Um, James Holden is our main character. He is a captain, a reluctant captain who is always somehow in the middle of things in this universe. And this book takes place within our own solar system. Um, and it takes place in a world where Mars and Earth are kind of like separate. Um, they have their own governments. They're separate from each other. We also have colonies throughout the entire solar system where people live um, on asteroids and artificial things and on moons and all kinds of things. And um, this book was just really great. I would say that my previous complaints about this book were that I found it difficult to care about some of the characters and that I didn't think they did a very good job writing female characters that didn't just exist to have something to do for the male characters. And that started to get a little better in book two. Book one, it was not good. But in book three, I mean, I just, there were some great new female characters that we meet who I loved. Um, female characters really kind of drive a lot of the plot line and it was just fantastic. So I'm still recommending The Expanse and I think that it is worth getting into if you're looking for a very long, very kind of popcorny, um, but still, still good sci-fi series. This is long. It's over 500 pages and I didn't take that long to read it because I thought it was so good. So five stars. All right, we are getting toward the end of this incredibly long list. Um, and I'm going to give you a nonfiction book. And actually, I think the only nonfiction book that I have read this year, because I have not been in a nonfiction place for whatever reason. That is The Exvangelicals by Sarah McCammon. I have kind of mixed feelings about this book. I like the cover because the colors are my cover colors. And actually, I think if you want to put it up here with Southernmost, those are kind of the same thing, right? Um, but anyway, I got this book out of a little free library a couple months ago, and I wanted to read it because it promises to be a look at um, changes basically within the evangelical church over probably the past 30 years, and also the author's own journey, I would say, away from the evangelical church. And I really enjoy reading, as I said earlier, stories about people questioning and changing their faith. Um, but this one, I feel like it, it couldn't quite decide whether or not it was going to be a serious, um, well-researched, academic, almost academic story about the evangelical church or whether it was going to be her personal story. It kind of tried to meld the two together. And for me, there wasn't really enough of either one for me to ever feel really, really invested in the book. Um, and I've also read on this topic before, so I think I wasn't quite as... It wasn't new information for me for the most part. Um, so it was it was fine. It was fine. If you're interested in the topic, check it out. It's not a bad book. Uh, it was about a three star. So that's a middle of the road book for me. I don't have a lot to say about it because to be honest, it didn't really make that much of an impression on me. Um, but if you're interested in it, I would still recommend you check it out because it's interesting. Okay, the next book that I read is Long Live Evil by Sarah Reese Brennan. I had an arc of this book. I had requested it on the strength of the fact that I saw Lee Bardugo blurbing it, and I love Lee Bardugo and trust her, but I'll put right up front that this book didn't really work for me, and I think whether it would work for you is going to come down to how you feel about the sense of humor within the book, because the book is trying very, very hard to be funny and self-aware the entire time. And for me, it didn't work. Um, our main character, her name is Ray. She is someone who is dying of cancer quite young. I think that she's 20 years old when we start the book. And a mysterious woman comes to her as she lays in her hospital bed and tells her that she can have a bargain. She can go into this book that is her favorite fantasy series. And if she makes it out alive, um, then she can be cured and go back to her life. This is the start of a new series. So this is book one. Um, so she ends up in this world where she knows everything that's going to happen, she thinks, because she's read the books. Kind of. That's a plot point. So she doesn't really treat the other characters like they're real people, more like they're, you know, characters that she can kind of like move around on the stage a little bit. And also, as I said before, the humor, the one-liners, they are nonstop. The pop culture references, there are so many. And I don't like to read books that have a lot of pop culture references in them. Um, maybe it's just me. I mean, 
even books like some books that people really liked like Ready Player One. I hated Ready Player One. Hated it. Like the constant just like I'm going to mention something that you remember. <laughs> and that's nostalgic. Like that did not work for me. This book was not it was not that bad. Um, and I do think, you know, I do know that the author herself is a cancer survivor. And the parts of the book that were very real for me were the parts where she talked about that experience about what it's like to kind of be forgotten by people because it makes them uncomfortable that you're ill, that kind of thing. Um, I thought that that was very touching, but the book itself, like, no, no, two and a half stars um, for the realistic parts that I did like, but the fantasy stuff and the humor really didn't work for me. Uh, so your mileage may vary. You might you might love this book. It might be your kind of humor. So if you're interested in the idea of a girl who ends up in a book and she's not the hero, but now she's the villain, then this might be for you, but it, it wasn't for me. So that one was disappointing because I only request arcs that I'm interested in reading. So it was disappointing that I didn't like that one. Then the next book that I read was The Hazelborn Ladies Motorcycle and Flying Club. That's by Helen Simmons, who also wrote Major Pettigrew's Last Stand, which is a book that I really love. Um, and this book uh, is set in the past, as all her books are. I don't know why I said that. This book is set immediately after World War I. We have our main character who has been managing an estate during the war, but now that the men have returned from war, she's been told that there's no longer any need for her. Her mother has passed away. Um, she's estranged from her brother and she is kind of working as an old lady's companion. And so while she's there working as a companion, she meets some new friends. She meets these, um, these girls who repair and run a little bit of a motorcycle taxi service. She meets a young man who has recently returned from the war, um, who has been injured in the war and does not feel like there's a place for him either in this world now. And it's all very um, kind of, I would say, cozy for the most part, but it does have its moments where, where it's very serious and very dark. Um, overall, I thought this book was very charming. Um, I thought it was very sweet. Um, I did think that there was a little bit too much of a focus on a love story that I didn't really care about. There's actually kind of multiple love stories within the book. There's a lot going on here, a lot of characters. It's a little bit twee, and I feel like it's probably a little bit too long. I think it went on a little bit longer than I really wanted it to, and that was kind of a, a downside for me. Um, but I ended up at about a three and a half star, and if you like historical fiction, particularly historical fiction from this time period, if you liked her previous book, I think you probably like this one. Um, I just thought it was a little bit long, so it didn't quite get to those, those same levels for me, but I am glad that I read it. All right, and now we are at the very last book that I read in the month of August, and that is Slow Dance by Rainbow Rowell. Um, I honestly was not planning to read this book. I have read a lot of Rainbow Rowell's young adult books and actually really enjoyed them. I've always been a fan of her writing, but there was something about this book. I think it's this cover with the sad corsage. I don't like it. The cover is very, I don't know, it looks like a 1990s romance cover to me. Like, I just don't like the cover. And I think that's why I didn't want to read it, but I ended up really enjoying it. I do know that it is um, the pick this month for Reese's Book Club, if you're into that kind of thing. Our main character in this book is Shiloh, and Shiloh is recently divorced. She has two very young children, um, but she, and she's kind of struggling, I would say, in her life and her role. She's back living with her mother. It's just, life has not gone the way that she hoped that it would go. One day, one of her best friends um, moves back to the town that they're from, um, which I think is Omaha, Nebraska, and invites her to his wedding and she goes to the wedding and she runs into one of her former best friends, a man named Carrie. Carrie is in the Navy and she has not seen him in almost 20 years. And the minute they run into each other, it's clear that they still have feelings for each other from some unresolved things that happened when they were in high school and in college. I thought this was a very good, very realistic portrayal of what romance is like when you're in your 30s. 
and you have a little bit of history and experience behind you. It's not all like rainbows and puppies. Shiloh, to me, might she might frustrate some people. She's very opinionated and very worried about being hurt, and she puts a lot of shells around herself, but I related to her super hard, and I just loved her, and I loved Carrie. He was perfect. I loved her children. They were not annoying. Um, I just loved everything about this romance. I thought it was so sweet and so perfect, and I was rooting for them so hard, and I was so happy when it worked out. That would be a spoiler, but it's a romance, so you know it's gonna work out. So you should read this. Uh, four, maybe four and a half stars. Haven't decided on that one yet, but I loved it, and I definitely recommend you check it out. And with that, we have reached the end of my wrap-up video for August. I ended up reading a number of books that were not on my original TBR because I got in a mood reading kind of mood. Um, but I think it all worked out for the best because I found several five-star reads and I had a really great time reading and I matched my highest number of books finished in a month this year. I would also love to hear about what book you read in the month of August that you really loved. Please leave it down in the comments because I want to talk about it and get your recommendations. And I hope that you all have a great week. I will see you all in the next video. Goodbye.